Okay. Oh, all right. It's 10 a.m., Mary Ellen. Okay, Tessa, it's 10 a.m. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome. It's our 55th annual um, Southeastern meeting. Um, I'm sure I said this last year, um, although we had hoped we would be in person this year to have an opportunity to see you and to chat with you. We're happy that you're here via Zoom. And we're also honored to have you here as we share, uh, especially Tessa shares, uh, the many projects and services that Southeastern has engaged in over the last year. I am particularly proud of the work that Tessa as our executive director and her staff have been able to accomplish despite the obstacles that COVID continues to bring along with it. Their professionalism, their dedication, and their loyalty to Southeastern and to you as our member libraries is truly inspirational. <clears throat> and here to tell you about their work is our executive director, Tessa Killian. Thank Tessa you so much. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much for that. Mm. I'm still thinking about what you said. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we're so pleased that everyone can join us. I see people are still entering in um, to the meeting. Um, so today's event includes, let me wait, hold on. Let me figure out my slides here. Here we go. All right, so today's events include a welcome by Heather Google. She'll be here in a few minutes to do that. Then I'll do my Southeastern report. Then we have um, our annual membership meeting and our featured speaker, Dr. Andrea Jamison. So I appreciate everyone being here this morning and spending time with us for the next couple hours. I am here in Highland, New York um, with three or four other staff who are in the building. Everybody else is, is remote this morning. Um, and I just wanted to give you a few housekeeping reminders before I turn it over to Heather. If you haven't already done so, please, I see, I haven't opened the chat. I see people are doing it. Now oh, Jen's putting the links in. People are saying good morning. Yes, this is great. So please continue to use the chat. You're welcome to put your name in there, where you worked, and tell anything else you'd like to, to say um, to get started. We're going to be using the chat throughout today's meeting to talk with other one another and ask questions. Um, and then we're also going to use it to post some links. Um, so we trust that you will be courteous and respectful of other attendees and follow Southeastern's code of conduct. This is our annual meeting. I don't foresee any problems, but I just wanted to put that out there and say that you have a link to it. Um, as Zach already started, we're recording the meeting so that it can be shared at a later time with anybody who wants to view it or people who missed, were, were able, had, you know, had a, had a miss today's meeting. Um, we have activated the Zoom feature for live closed captioning transcriptions. So if you wish to see the full transcript, I think everybody's screen might be a little different, but you find it, I think you'd find it under the three little dot menu for more that is on the right side of your Zoom bar at the bottom. Um, you should see an option there for viewing the transcript that will let you to follow along with the transcript that will appear on the right. Um, and if, if so, if you want to do that and you need it, it's there for you. And please, please, please use the reactions to share your feedback with the presenters. Um, I, I, I know I appreciate it. I know other people do. It's a really nice way to um, you know, let us know what you think about something by, so the reactions, again, they're either under the three little dots or they're at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Everyone's may look a little different, but it is called reactions. And what those reactions are, are is let you raise your hand, let you clap. There's emojis in there, there's some standard emojis. And then if you click on the more another dot menu, there's like an entire suite of emojis that you can pick from. So you can do, give somebody a gold star, you can you know, do whatever you want in there. Um, so as I have up on the screen here are today's uh, meeting materials, which then Jen already put them in the chat for us. Um, there's a, a link there under annual meeting. You'll see the description for Dr. Jamison's presentation, but above that, you'll see the meeting program. You'll see a link to the 2021 year in review document and the minutes from last year's meeting are all there. Um, so please take a moment to open that URL if you can, or have it around so that you can see the program. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Heather, 
who is going to, we're going to hear from her as a guest. Heather is an Oneida Stockbridge Muncie representative. She's also an independent Indigenous consultant. And this morning, she's going to share a land recognition with us. So Heather, I know I don't see you at the moment. I know you're here because I already talked to you, yep, but I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. There you are. Okay. All right. It's all yours, Heather. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I look forward to your land recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. And thank you to everyone who's here today and to the Southeastern New York Library Association. I'm super stoked to be able to present this to you. Just a quick information about myself. My name is Heather. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and a first line descendant, Stockbridge Muncie, which is Mohican Nation. I work as a historian, um, I lecture, I do workshop trainings, um, and I do all sorts of fun things. Like yesterday, um, I was at a conference here in the city. I'm coming to you from Times Square. Um, I did a conference on housing, um, or I did a workshop on housing. So I talk about a lot of different things. I'm really honored to be able to deliver the land acknowledgement for today's session. And then I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about why land acknowledgements are important. I'm just gonna take a few moments of your time. We acknowledge that we are all coming from different locations that were the ancestral homes of indigenous peoples. In the city of New York, in the state of New York, in the southeastern part of New York, we acknowledge the Lenape people and the Mohican nation. We acknowledge that through forced land sessions and removal, these nations were removed from the lands that they called home and their seats of government are now located in Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and Canada. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present. And we understand that this acknowledgement is just a first step in the process of building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. It's important to do land acknowledgements because as I said yesterday during a workshop, it honors the land. But when you do a land acknowledgement, you're also honoring the indigenous peoples and you're letting people know that indigenous peoples still exist, that we are still here and that we are still part of this uh, blanket that is the United States, that our histories matter. And when you do them, you're acknowledging that. I've had people plenty of times come up to me after um, I do a lecture or something and say, oh my gosh, you know, they thank me for whatever I talked about, but then saying, oh my gosh, I didn't know indigenous people still existed. Um, and like genuinely not knowing that. So when you do land acknowledgements and you do them correctly, you're letting people know of our existence and that we're still here and that we still matter. It's important. And it's also important to recognize the history of the land that you're on. So whether that is through forced removal, um, treaties, land sessions, what have you, it's important to honor that because the land to indigenous peoples, it's living and it's breathing and it's part of us. And the history of that land and our history of it is so much bigger than the history of New York State or New York City or Times Square. It's a bigger history, it's a fuller history, and it's a history that we need to talk about time and time again. So I'm so honored to have been able to deliver um, the land acknowledgement for your 55th annual meeting. Um, I hope next year you can meet in person. Hopefully that would be great. And I do know that um, links to my website uh, went into the chat. So if you ever want to get a hold of me for anything, do please reach out that way. Um, and again, thank you so much, Tessa and the rest of the group. And I hope you guys have a really awesome meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was perfect. Thank you so much for joining us and for doing that for us today. Um, I listened. It, I think Sarah put the link to your program that you did for teaching the Hudson Valley in the chat as well. Uh, I that was, which was excellent. And I always enjoy learning from you. So thank you very much, Heather, for joining us today and doing that land recognition. I really thank you very it. much. Thank you. My pleasure. Right, have a good day. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I would, but I got to go catch a train. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. All right. I'm going to move on to Southeastern's annual report. How many people were we up to? We're getting there. All right. For this year's annual report, I plan to feature our accomplishments and our members' fantastic work that is a little bit different than our bread and butter services. Everyone on staff contributed today's presentation by sharing with me something significant that they want us all to know about. So that's what I'm gonna to do today. And here we all are. Um, I think at this point, I'm looking at the list, everyone knows us, but in just in case you don't, um, I'm gonna be, be referring to the staff today by first name throughout the morning. So if you don't know us through our interactions with you already, we are all pictured here. Um, 
And I'm going to start clockwise from, from top left. Um, we have Zach Spaulding, Southeastern Systems Manager, Sarah Holstead, the Hospital Library Services Manager. There's me, and then there's Carolyn bennett Glauda, Southeastern's Education and Outreach Librarian, Jennifer Palmentero, Digital Services Manager, Liz Gurdon, Finance Manager, Kelsey Milner, Resource Sharing Cataloging Librarian, and then in the middle, we have Moshe Siegel, our office manager. So that is the Southeastern team. This picture is from Advocacy Day, um, I think 2021, and it is a personal favorite. I will use it uh, every opportunity I got to show us all off. So that's the Southeastern team. And the first thing I wanna to talk to you to today about is um, some of our over our ARPA projects. So um, like I said, this is gonna be a tour of all the different things we've done this year, starting out with ARPA. Um, so last July, we received news that the New York State Library received $6.2 million in federal ARPA funds. And the grants from IMLS would be distributed um, as sub awards through the councils. So we received, or I haven't received it yet, but we're going to, a $462,000 award to design and implement projects in three main categories. Their digital inclusion, library museum partnerships, and digital resources for students. The majority of this money, um, about 94%, goes directly to our partners and our vendors. So we have very little overhead with this project. The original implementation timeline was really short. They let us know like last July that this was happening. The grant started in January and they were supposed to end in June. So that is six months, which was you know tight. Um, but thankfully we received an extension until March, 2023, allowing us to do more work on some of the projects and collect more data on others. So what are we doing with all of this money and these projects for our members and our communities? And I'm gonna tell you a bit about the projects now. Um, we have two digital inclusion projects. One of them is Digital Navigators of the Hudson Valley. So in partnership with the Mid-Hudson Library System, the Rampo Casco Library System, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and Carolyn is the project manager, we trained and actively support 72 people from 48 libraries and other community organizations. So those of you who aren't as familiar with Digital Navigators yet, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what they do. A Digital Navigator is an individual who is trained to help people who need affordable broadband in their homes, affordable devices that are appropriate for their needs, and general technology and digital literacy help. Since February, this current cohort, cohort of 72 people have um, learned how to be digital navigators and they are actively serving in this role at their organizations. That's one of the requirements is they have for the, for the grant is they have to do the work and show us that they're doing the work. So this goes well beyond just a training program. Um, we support the digital navigators in many ways. Among other her other responsibilities, Carolyn meets with them weekly to discuss their progress, their successes and any questions that they have. We also provide them with digital and um, print marketing materials in English and Spanish. So Liz managed the logistics of getting these materials printed and shipped to 48 locations. Um, and then this slide here shows one of the social media graphics that we had made. And um, this is one of my, one of my favorites. Um, and if you wanna see the full list of digital navigators and the communities they serve, see the link, Jen pop that into the chat for me. Um, the majority of the, of the 42 institutions are public libraries, but we're also working with Mount St. Mary College and uh, three community-based organizations. I know a number of our digital navigators are here today, and I am super proud of all of the work that we're doing and that we're able to support for them. Another digital inclusion project is Beyond the Library Wi-Fi Access Project, which is being implemented by the staff at the Mid-Hudson Library System and the Ramapo Catskill Library System. Several libraries in each system are installing devices that extend the wireless signal at their libraries to outside the building and into their surrounding areas, which is increasing um, the internet access for that community. And we found, I think a lot of libraries found during the early days of the pandemic that those spaces were, were being used by people who needed Wi-Fi. And so now these libraries are making an extra effort to make sure that Wi-Fi is continues to be available and really good out into those areas like you know parking lots and parks and areas right near their library. All right. 
Through a grant review process for the library and museum partnership component, Southeastern awarded funds to six projects demonstrating how they can connect information, increase visual literacy, and address object-based learning. So Sarah is the lead staff working on with the libraries on these projects. And um, this is one of my favorite pictures that we've seen from this grant. So pictured here is um, a program that happened at the Claverick Free Library where they learned the science behind crime scene investigations, one of their programs. One criteria for this award was, this was a key criteria, was that each library had to partner with another organization in the community. It was a truly a partnership grant. So the projects, I'm not gonna read through the whole list, but the six projects are in Kingston, Goshen, Olive, Marlboro, Rosendale, and several libraries in Columbia County, including Claverick that you just saw and Chatham. Um, many of these uh, projects have upcoming programs that are open to the public. So I'm gonna put a little pitch in for that. Um, Jen's gonna put a link in there for me to the, to the list on our LibGuide that has all the programs. But next Saturday, June 11th, there's gonna be a baseball game in Goshen. So um, we wanna make sure that's well attended. And I know a lot of you are down in Orange County. So just saying, there's gonna be a real cool old time baseball game with a harness racing um, demo at the Goshen in Goshen. So um, anyway, we're really excited about these projects and I wanted to share that one with you all. No, I think we have some school library folks here too. So the third component of this grant is for the schools and their students. So each of the BOCES, five, um, we have five of them in our region, the BOCES school library systems received funds to purchase eBooks, audiobooks, or streaming content that enhances student learning. Several BOCES are li licensing SOAR content from Overdrive. This is a little SOAR logo I put up there. Um, so they purchase resources for students with special needs and in languages other than English, and much of the content covers um, civil readiness and social justice. So that is the last slide I have for ARPA, um, but I just want to say that implementing this grant is a significant accomplishment for our members and for us. I'm super proud and pleased that we had this opportunity. Hopefully more opportunities to provide digital inclusion um, services will be in our future, but um, yeah, I'm just really pleased that we were able to do this work for, for our members. So I'm gonna move on to another grant that we're involved in. Um, this is another IMLS grant that we are working with um, the New York State Archives Partnership Trust on. It's called Consider the Source and it's managed by Kelsey. We are collaborating with the Hudson Area, Area Library and Orange Ulster BOCES to identify collections of primary source materials for communities that have been underrepresented and then make them available to teachers. So this grant also funded a knowledge institute and that's what it's pictured here. It was held at Locust, anybody who's been to Locust Grove would recognize that room, right? Um, this grant, this knowledge institute was held at Locust Grove in early May and the purpose of the program was to connect teachers with cultural heritage professionals. Um, this grant is for two years, so we expect to see many more collaborations and content being made accessible through this project. All right, many of you are familiar with our digital projects, but Jen and I went through the list. We want, I wanted to know how many members you know, are part of our digital project, 61. So we have 100 members, 61 of them have digital collections hosted by one of the services listed here, which are New York Heritage, our historical newspaper project and our online exhibits. But today I wanna to mention two new collections that Jen and I find particularly significant. And they're from two of our Ulster County libraries, um, smaller libraries, Olive and West Hurley. So they digitized images and documents in these new collections that show their communities you know, before the reservoir was built, its construction and what was lost. Um, the other cool thing that's worth mentioning is that they kind of coincidentally as neighboring libraries created these collections at the same time. So I'm sure they talk regularly, but but they did this kind of, it was like they both had these collections and they both digitized them and it's just, we just find it really cool. Um, and the image on, the one is a postcard, the top one from um, Olive, but the bottom one is, is it is a still of um, a picture of a model 
that they that they had at West Hurley. And the director there has wanted to digitize and make these collections available for a really long time. So we're really pleased to see that happening now. So take a look. Um, they're both in New York Heritage and they have a lot of content in there about, about the reservoir. And I'm curious to know what Jen put in the chat, but I'm gonna have to wait and look at it later. <laughs> Keep going. All right. So learning and networking. Um, what I wanna say today about our professional development has to do with our hybrid events. So in the spring, we purchased a suite of hardware, it's cameras, microphones, soundboards, a, a whole AV setup, um, like almost like a studio. We had a grant from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine that, that allowed us to do this and purchase this, this equipment so that we could host um, hybrid events. So we tested it all during CENICON this year uh, and it went exceptionally well. We were really pleased with, with how this program went. Um, so what we mean by hybrid is that we had speakers presenting from our conference room to a live audience and an online audience. So if you look at the top picture, um, they were kind of getting ready between sessions, but um, the speaker is in the corner and then she broadcast out from that space to both of those audiences. We also had speakers who were broadcasting from remote locations. So the so then the, the people in the room could watch it on the screen. So we had a lot going on and it was complicated. Um, but Carolyn and Zach teamed up to make this event a success um, along with the day speakers who I have to say were very brave enough to go on this ride with us and uh, try, try it out, which is kind of, if you know CineCon, that's kind of what it's all about anyway, is trying some new things. Uh, and we did that too, and I'm really pleased with how it how it turned out. Um, moving forward, we plan to do more events in this format. We found that it is increasingly difficult for people to leave their workspaces to attend training. Um, and we believe that this trend will continue post pandemic. So we are prepared to continue offering programs in this way. I believe that um, it makes events more accessible to a broader audience. So we will see how it goes, um, but we are positioned to, to do more of it. All right, I wanna say a few words about hospital libraries. Um, so providing, providing services to hospital libraries is very unique to the councils. Um, it's one of the things that, that we do that other library systems don't, and I think it's new, very unique to New York as well. Um, and then hospital libraries themselves are very, very specialized. So we've learned from them throughout the years. You know, we know what they do because we serve them, but all of you have learned a lot about hospital libraries as well. Um, but I want to share a little bit about what we're doing that's a little different now. Um, and I want you to see these two models for serving the hospital communities. So on the left of the screen, you'll see our our vital staffing program where Sarah delivers library services to the four communities and hospitals listed in uh, Middletown, Nyack, Havistraw, and in Newburgh. On the right are the hospitals that employ medical librarians. So we're so pleased to see support for them in these three systems. And I wanna focus for a moment on Good Sam Hospital, Good Samaritan Hospital, where they recently hired a new medical librarian when the previous librarian retired. Some of you may remember Frank Appel, he, re he retired. Um, when he retired, there was a gap between librarians, but not in library service because Sarah filled that role for them. So we are, are so incredibly pleased that we could help them during this transition. I also want to acknowledge the hospital for realizing the value and importance of employing a librarian to provide hospital library services. So I don't know if she's here, but the medical librarian is, is registered for the program. Um, so this is a win-win for Southeastern and our services, but it's also a win, a real win for the hospital. Um, and it's also a win for the medical staff and those served by, by Good Samaritan in Suffren. All right, coordinated collection development program. So I want to say a, word, a few words about this legacy grant that we have from New York State for the academic libraries. We call it CCDA. Um, I call it a legacy grant because it's been around for over 30 years. I didn't go back to see how long, you know, when it started, um, but it's been around for at least 30 years. And this grant is for not-for-profit colleges um, 
to collect materials in specific subject areas. And they also, through this grant, they have to agree to share them with other libraries. So each, and I, I know, I think a lot of them purchase these the print materials. They're allowed to pur purchase electronic materials as well, um, but I think a lot of them do collect print. So I wanted just to give you a sample of some of the subject areas that they do collect in. Um, and I listed those there. And just to let you know that they're available through our library loan, they have to share them. So um, if you're interested, we do keep a list on our website as well. Um, but at Southeastern, Moshe facilitates the application process for us between the libraries and the New York State Library. And he told me when we were you know, preparing for this and things that we wanted to talk about, that it's really nice to see the tangible impact of this grant on our region's library collections. So it's something that we do that we don't often talk about, but um, the colleges get over $100,000 of state aid to collect. So that, that's pretty cool. So now I wanna share with you two projects that we lead for the Empire State Library Network. And I'm gonna start with Empire ADC. Um, so we're really pleased to share that last fall we launched version 2.0 of Empire ADC, which is the state repository for finding aids. So I'm gonna give us a gold star for this. Um, Jen and Zach designed, implemented a new system and website, which included the migration of the finding aids from the legacy system. They also did a lot of training with, with the other councils and with participating organizations. So this new system is designed to support any organization with collections they wish to describe from the smallest to the largest. Some Southeastern members contributing to Empire ADC include Bard, Marist, SUNY New Pulse, Hudson River Maritime Museum, and the Hudson Area Library. So we've been on this journey to a stable platform for several years and we're finally there. So I'm really proud to share that with you. Um, and I think Jen put the link in there for Empire ADC if you wanna take a look. The other ESLN project that I want to mention is Pillars, um, the Pillars Symposium. In July, 2021, Carolyn managed the symposium, which was a three-day conference on the high school to college transition. It featured presentations from educators and librarians all over the state. Carolyn and her team are producing a one-day conference this year with live presentations and a guest speaker named uh, Judith Human. She is a, if you don't know of her, she is a leader in disability rights. She's, she's a really big deal. Um, and she will be their keynote for accessibility and education symposium. Uh, registration for the symposium is open if you're interested in attending and hearing the presentations and from, from Judy Human. So that wraps up my highlights. Um, those are some really cool things that we've been able to do that I'm really pleased that I was able to share with you. I encourage you to look, take a look at the year in review document too. It is a snapshot of all of our activities from last year. It also lists all of our committees, our members, trustees, and the financials from our auditors, and lots of data points on how you used our services this past year. The morning would not be complete without thanking members who participated in committees. Um, this year, we added a new committee. It was the Ad Hoc EDI, or Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. They are helping develop um, new services for members. But all of these groups are important and provide guidance and support for our services. I want to thank you all for volunteering and working with us on these, in these specialized areas. I also want to acknowledge the Board of Trustees and thank them for their time and expertise in helping govern the Council. You will be hearing from them in a few minutes during the membership meeting, but in addition to their report, I wanna share with you just a few things now. One is that um, they passed the budget for the new fiscal year that begins in July, so I am very thankful for that. Also, when we did an assessment for um, you know, creating the budget, the assessment of our finances, we showed that the council's in, in good fiscal health. Um, this year's New York State budget includes an increase in state aid to libraries, and what this means for us is that we should see a bit over 5% increase in these funds, which will certainly help our revenue. 
Investments and resources for the new year include money for members to help them make impactful changes in their organization regarding equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we hope to fund planning grants for EDI assessments, um, planning grants or EDI assessments or a combination of them. So we'll have more to come in the new fiscal year, but we do have money set aside for that initiative, which I'm really pleased about. So in summary, I wanna thank you all for taking this tour with me um, of what's been happening at Southeastern and with our members. We are so honored to provide programs for you and plan to continue doing more and finding more ways to serve you and your communities. So that is my report. Thank you very much for um, listening to me. Now it's my privilege to serve you in this way and thank you. And Mary Ellen, I am going to conclude there okay. and turn it over to you to open up the business meeting. Hey, thank you, Tessa. Um, I neglected to say who I was when I welcomed everybody. I've been around for so long, I just assume everybody knows who I am. But um, there are some new folks here today when I was looking at the registration. So I am the current president of the board. And I, in my library career, was the director of the Newburgh Free Library. And when I left the library profession, I went into school administration. And when I retired, I was the assistant superintendent for human resources at the Newburgh School District. So now you all know who this person is who's doing a lot of talking today. So it's my role right now to open the business part of our uh, membership meeting. We will be taking care of uh, three different items during this business portion. We will be approving the minutes from last year's annual meeting. We will be introducing new trustees and um, the officers for next year for the Board of Trustees. And also we will be reviewing the bylaw changes that were made during this past year. So first up is the approval of the minutes from the June 4th, 2021 annual meeting. The link to those meeting, uh, those minutes rather are in the chat. Um, so they have been posted. And if anybody um, who has had an opportunity to review those minutes has any corrections or edits, if you could please let us know about that now at this point. Gina. Yes, Mary Ellen, I want to correct a uh, spelling error in your name, actually. <laughs> 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 under mm -hmm. under the section for trustee and officer nominating committee, um, the N is missing in Ellen. Okay, thank you. You're mm -hmm. welcome. Any other corrections or additions, edits? So um, we no longer have to um, vote on um, the approval of the minutes. So at this time, um, the minutes are approved with the amendment made by Gina to the spelling of my name. So um, that's our first part of uh, our business that we have taken care of. Next um, will be the trustee and nominating committee's report. And that is chaired by Gina Trask. And Gina is a librarian at Mount St. Mary College. So it's all yours, Gina, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mary Ellen. And I wanna thank all the governing members for participating in our online election. So on behalf of the trustee and officer nominating committee, I have the pleasure to introduce the one person that was elected to Southeastern's board of trustees this year. The newly elected trustee is Christy Lee. Christy will be representing academic libraries. Christy is currently the head of library technology and the interim dean of library at the Sojourner Truth Library at SUNY New Paltz. So please join me in congratulating Christy who will be starting her first five-year term on the board on July 1st. So thank you, Christy, Christy for joining us today um, on the call and for agreeing to serve. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Christine. Uh, up next are an announcement of the slate of officers for the 2022-2023 Board of Trustees. Uh, these positions will be voted on by the trustees in our meeting that is preceding the annual meeting. Um, so the slate of officers includes myself, Gina Trask, as president, Becky Albitz as vice president, Beth Zambito as secretary, 
Ellen Rubin as treasurer, Floyd Latin as the assistant secretary treasurer. And please take a moment to thank all our co colleagues who have kindly volunteered to serve on the board this year. Thank you. I appreciate everyone who has agreed. <laughs> thank <laughs> uh, you, everybody. Thank you. Um, up next is Laura Street from Vassar College, who is the chair of the bylaws committee. You're up next, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I am currently chairing the bylaws committee. On the committee is Sheena and also uh, Beth Sambito, Mark Colson. Um, so Tessa worked with, with me and the committee on a complete revision of the bylaws. Um, we made them available for uh, comment in April. Thank you to everyone who commented. Revisions were then approved by the Board of Trustees on May 19th, 2022. A link to the newly updated bylaws is being posted in the chat. Um, the notable changes, aside from Tessa has pointed out, 8 million Seni lurks being replaced by Southeastern, um, include the number of trustees serving on the, on the board are now no less than 13 and no more than 15, and the vice president will be slated to become president. Uh, and that's it for the bylaws revisions. Thank you. Next up is Mary Ellen. Thank you, Laura. Um, so um, before we conclude um, the business portion of the meeting, I just want to acknowledge two of our trustees who retired during this uh, year at, as they served as trustees. First is Mark Colson, who was the uh, Dean of the Sojourner Truth Library at SUNY New Paltz. He's retired. And secondly is Ginny Dunnigan, who is the director of the library at St. Thomas Aquinas College. I believe G Ginny is with us um, at the meeting today. Um, and I just want to uh, thank you for your service on the Southeastern Board. And probably more particularly, you have been in the area for a while, serving your own library and serving Southeastern. So just thank you for your contributions to the Regional Library Committee. So both to Mark and to Ginny, um, you have our best wishes um, in your retirement for great times and great health. Thank you very much. That concludes the business part of our meeting. And next I turn it over back over to Tessa to get us ready for our keynote speaker. Tessa. It is my pleasure to introduce today's featured speaker, Dr. Andrea Jamison. She is an assistant professor of librarianship at Illinois State University. She speaks internationally on library inclus inclusivity, intellectual freedom, and the interplay of race, power, and privilege in children's books. Dr. Jamison has conducted content analysis on hundreds of collection development policies to determine how they address diversity and align with ALA's Bill of Rights. She also chaired a working group that revised ALA's Bill of Rights for diverse library collections. We learned of her work from a keynote presentation she gave this spring at the Acquisitions Institute in Oregon, um, which is in Portland, I believe she said. So I was excited to read that description of her presentation. Once I saw that announcement, I was like, I want to have her be our keynote this year. I wanna hear from her. I want you to hear from her. So I am so pleased that she is here. Um, she's gonna share her presentation called Unbalanced Censorship, Equity, and freedom. Dr. Jameson is presenting today from sh Chicago. So we are so happy to have you here, Dr. Jameson. I've lost you on my screen again. I wanna like at least see your face. There you are, okay. With that, with that said, I'm turning over to you, Dr. Jameson, it's all yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So I want to begin by first just saying that I am so honored to be here today to have the opportunity to engage with each of you in this very meaningful conversation about balancing equity. And uh, I want to say thank you, especially to the planning committee for including the work that I do as part of your summer meeting. It is my hope and my expectation that I am able to share some information with you that will resonate with you in such a way 
that when you leave uh, this presentation or after this keynote that you will be inspired to continue doing the great work that you are doing. And so with that being said, um, I want to start by saying that I definitely believe that this conversation that we are having about uh, censorship, equity, and freedom is a necessary conversation. If you work in libraries, or even if you just have a love of libraries, I think that it is impossible not to be impacted, or dare I even say triggered, by the number of attempts to not only censor books, but to censor the work and the professional commitment of librarians. And what's more disheartening is that Censors are just attempting, are not just attempting to censor books themselves. They are attempting to unravel our democracy. And we can see that in a lot of the legislation that has been passed or that's attempting to be passed. And so if you look at legislation like Oklahoma's, and I won't go through this entire list because we can spend this entire keynote presentation talking about some of these legislations. But if you look at Oklahoma Senate Bill 1142, this bill attempts to prohibit schools and their libraries from carrying books that discuss information about sexual preference, sexual identity and gender identity. And if this bill is successful, this bill will give parents the right to request that books are removed from school library shelves. Now, the danger of that is not only would they face a 10,000, the schools themselves would face a $10,000 per day fine if they did not remove the book, but the danger is the fact that we know unequivocally that minors have First Amendment rights. And while parents do have the right to decide what their child can or cannot have access to, that parent does not have the right to make that decision for every single child that is in a school building or that is being serviced by a school library. Another example of a bill would be Tennessee House Bill 800. And this particular bill attempts to prohibit schools from using books that, and I quote, promote, normalize, support, or address LGBTQIA plus lifestyles. And so if we unpack that language, if we really just take a moment to reflect upon it, the word normalize really infers or indicates that there is a way of life that is a part of the norm. And anything outside of that normative way of life is in fact abnormal, okay? And so aside from that, you also have Texas Bill HB 3979. And I'm sorry, I cannot make this up. This bill states, or it attempts to prohibit schools from using critical race theory. So essentially the danger here is that this bill is attempting to silence the counter narratives of African Americans in regards to discussions or narratives about over 400 years of oppression that have been experienced by the African American community. Okay. So we have these bills and what's really disheartening is that we know that legislation or that laws are supposed to, in theory, protect people and by protecting their civil liberties. 
but we have to interrogate and really pay attention to what is happening when we see legislation that uses terminology like normalize or prohibits conversations about LGBTQIA communities or about narratives such as the critical race theory, because according to the censors, those narratives are divisive or are viewed as being anti-democratic. But that's another conversation. But what I will say is that it's very important for us as librarians to have these conversations because these conversations give us the opportunity to have moments of reckoning where we can ask ourselves the questions that we need to ask to remind ourselves about our personal commitment to the work of librarianship and about our professional ethics. And so I wanna share with you some of the questions that I continue to to ask myself as I see a lot of these censorship efforts, and these are concerted efforts that are taking place in society. So one of the first question that, questions that I ask myself is, what is the danger of information? What are our censors attempting to accomplish by silencing voices, or not only by silencing voices, but by limiting information? You have to ask yourself, is information dangerous? And I'm sure that we as librarians, we can all, or at least most of us can attest, or I would hope that most of us would, would attest to the fact that information is absolutely not dangerous. In fact, it is just the opposite. Information is empowering. It is also liberating, particularly for those that are disadvantaged in society. So I do not feel that our, our censors are being authentic when they say that they are trying to protect us from information that can be harmful because we do not have an information problem in this society. What we have is a problem with misinformation. And when misinformation occurs, occurs, what is happening or what is the danger is the fact that you have groups of people that are trying to control narratives. And we all know what happens when narratives are being controlled. When you can control narratives, you can gain influence over what people believe by virtue of just giving them one single narrative or one single perspective. And unfortunately, in order for for a democratic society to thrive, we need to have multiple perspectives. We need to have people that are able to think critically and to engage in rich discourse that would allow us to challenge our own assumptions and our own practices so that we can continue to make changes and correct those things that do not serve all of humanity, but only seek to serve a few. So. I have this analogy for my for how to describe what I view as groups of people and typically it's usually those groups that are in power that attempt to control narratives. So I want you to bear with me because sometimes when I hear this this analogy, I say to myself, it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny analogy, but I, I hope it kind of conveys my the heart of the message that I'm trying to say. So imagine having only one restaurant in your neighborhood, your community, or your city. And every time that you go into that restaurant, you are constantly being told that there is only one item on the menu. So you have no other options. So you are presented with one item that you have to pay for, and you have no other choices, and you cannot go to any other restaurant to be able to, to 
replace what you're not getting from this restaurant. So I liken that to being uh, problematic because what happens if you are a person that is unable to eat or consume the one item that is being presented to you? So let's say, for example, you are vegan, if you are keto, if you are on a paleo diet, or if you have some type of health issue where you can't consume certain fats or maybe sodium, and that one meal that is being served is that one meal that is detrimental or that can harm you health-wise. So if you think about it, you're essentially being told to eat what is being served, and it doesn't matter if it hurts or if it harms you. And unfortunately, that is what is happening every single day in this country. We tell BIPOC communities and individuals with exceptionalities and members of the LGBTQIA plus communities that they can have a seat at our table when we have these conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, but they cannot give their input or that they can be a part of some of the decision-making process, but them being a part of that decision-making process, they cannot have a choice. They cannot actually enact any type of real change in our society. So I want to focus this conversation on the fact that as librarians, we have to think of what our role is in terms of making sure that the scales of justice, that the scales of equity, that the scales of freedom is not balanced for some, but then unbalanced for the rest of society. And so to do that, I think that I would like to, if you would just indulge me for a moment, walk you through a story about the history of libraries, because we often don't talk about the history in relationship to where we are today. In libraries, we often talk about the fact that we do not have a lot of librarians that are from the BIPOC community, or that we do not have a lot of students that are from the BIPOC community that attend library schools or that have an interest in LIS as a profession. Or we often talk about the fact that in certain communities, the library services are still subpar. But how did we get there? There is a history, and I think that history is very important in helping to contextualizing why we are in the space that we are in and to help sort of set a um, map for us in terms of where we need to think about in terms of our future. So my story is this, in 1896, um, after Plessy versus Ferguson, segregation became legitimized. And not only was de jure segregation permissible on trains, but it was also permissible in schools. We talk about the segregation that was permissible in schools, but rarely do we talk about the segregation that was allowed to to happen in libraries. In the South, there were libraries that African Americans could not check out books unless it could be proven that they were checking out books that were only for the use, that were to be used by a white male. And in some cases, African Americans African Americans cannot even enter a librarian. And of course, this created problems because libraries and librarians in the North operated one way, while libraries in the South operated another. And because of this dissension within libraries, the American Library Association drew criticism because libraries were at that time thought of being the cradle of democracy. And the way that we came to be thought of as the cradle of democracy is thanks to the work of Andrew Carnegie, a businessman who gave lots of money, who donated, in fact, over $40 million to help build over 1,600 public libraries. 
Carnegie did this because he believed that libraries would educate and uplift people regardless of their economic status or their class. Now, when Carnegie talked about libraries, and of course, people listened to Carnegie because Lark Carnegie donated so much money and his work, his, his, his benevolence is the cause and the reason why libraries, so many libraries exist today. So he had a lot of influence. But when Carnegie talked about libraries, Carnegie himself referred to libraries as a cradle of democracy. And one of the quotes that Carnegie used, it which or that he's that Carnegie is known for that I use often is this quote here. It says that there is not such a cradle of democracy upon the earth as the free public library. This republic of letter where neither rank, office, nor wealth receives the slightest consideration. So it is that belief that gave people hope during that time that libraries could make education accessible for everyone. Right? And when we talk about education, we're not talking about the oppressive type of education where you're being told what to think or how to think. And if you have not read the book by Paulo Freire, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, I like to recommend it for you because education should not serve to further oppress people by telling them how to think or about in encouraging people to continue to move along a certain uh, stratus or continuum where we continue to perpetuate the norms, but it should be a type of education that liberates people, that inspires people or encourages them to question the norms and practices of society, particularly if there are groups that are being harmed by those practices. But uh, Carnegie himself, he inspired a type of education that was an education for all, where people can go into libraries, where they can learn and they can pursue whatever was of interest to them. And that is what libraries suppose, and hopefully that is what we do today. Our role is to meet the needs and interests of our users, whether those users are from racially, uh, disadvantaged communities, socially and economically disadvantaged communities, whether they have money, whether they have finances, whether they can attend college, whether they cannot attend college. Our role as the library is to support the democracy in America by supporting access to information, information that liberates. But back to my story, the early 20th century libraries did not fully represent the idea of democracy. Libraries in the North were at, librarians in the North were constantly at odds with librarians in the South. So what happened is not only were we experiences, experiencing racism and racial tension in American society itself, but we also experienced that type of dissension within libraries. So you had librarians, some librarians were against segregation, they were allies, and they wanted to see African Americans no longer oppressed, or they wanted to see African Americans being served in libraries the same way that white patrons were being served in libraries. But those librarians were at odds against librarians who were for segregation and for the maltreatment of African Americans. And then you had a third sector of librarians who were just neutral on the matter. And what happened is that when you have librarians that are indifferent, that is what Dr. King spoke about when he talked about the need for racial progress or the need for equity for everyone. It wasn't the ones that were 
overtly, uh, that were overtly racist or that were discriminatory. It were the moderates, the people who were neutral, who in an attempt to not appear to be biased, they were actually perpetuating systems of, of oppression through their silence. But because the early 20th century libraries did not fully represent the idea of democracy, a lot of criticism grew for the libraries and a lot of pressure was put on the American Library Association. So in 1930s, civil rights leaders were starting, had started to demand that libraries speak out against the injustices that were happening in America and that were happening abroad. And specifically, specifically to speak out against the injustices that were taking place or being embodied within libraries themselves. And so leaders asked the American Library Association to condemn racism and to condemn the book burnings that were taking place in Germany as well as in Austria. But while library leaders attempted to be neutral, they had to respond. And again, I want to emphasize the point about neutrality because library leaders within American Library Library Association, they did not want to appear to take any sides on the issue because they did not want to appear to be bias. But again, I want to submit for your commit your consideration, what happens when we are neutral? Does our neutrality actually actually conveys a message of being non biased, as it as much as it conveys a message of perhaps being in consent, or being a, a sort of a uh, in agreement to the oppression of groups that are being unfairly subjugated to unjust laws. So library leaders, in an attempt to respond to the pressure, they created what we follow today, and this is the first iteration of the 1939 Library Bill of Rights. And I get excited about this because this is what my research involves. It involves looking at policy and how policies either perpetuate diversity and equities in our profession, or if they actually work to mitigate those diversity and equities. So so the 1939 Bill of Rights was the American Library's way of asserting a position, but the criticism that the library has received is that the assertion was very ambiguous. And while the Bill of Rights was a noble effort, it could not be enforced, and it did very little to stop the tensions and the war that was that was waging between libraries in the North as well as libraries in the South. So these inequities continued within libraries. And so while libraries remained at odds, society grew in patient. And quoting again from Dr. King, Dr. King said, when there is a group of people that are unheard, violence and riot becomes the language of the unheard. And that is exactly what started to happen in libraries, although we do not talk about it often. In 1960, a group of unheard students known as the Greenville Eight staged a protest at the Greenville Public County or the County Public Library in South Carolina. Then in 1961, another group of students called the Tougaloo Nine became criminals. They became criminals because they walked into a library in Jackson, Mississippi, and they attempted to borrow a book for a research project. In 1964, Four teenagers known as the St. Helena Four made attempts to enter the St. Helena Library in Greensburg, Louisiana, but they were locked out. And what's interesting is they were locked out by a librarian. And so what happened, as we all know, what followed were years of struggle. And if we fast forward to 
today, we still continue to see a lot of that struggle, not only in society, but, the, but in libraries as well. So if you take a look at this slide, and if I just want you to think about what's happening today in terms of society with censorship. In 2015, there were over 275 book challenges or bans. In 2020, in 2020, there were 273 books that were challenged or banned. But in 2021, there were over 729 challenges that resulted in over 1,597 books that were either challenged or banned. Okay. Now, I mentioned that that's what's happening in society in terms of the tension that we are facing regarding books and the content that's provided in those books and what's not mentioned or i'm sorry what i did not mention which is very important is the fact that most of the book challenges that occurred in 2021 were books that were representative of bipoc or lgbtqia plus communities and so we have to think about again what our are our sensors really aiming to do or what are they trying to accomplish? Now, aside from the intellectual freedom challenges and attempts to limit the, right, the rights of minoritized communities, libraries, similar to the libraries of the early 20th century, today's libraries were still fighting internal inequities. You have some librarians today who are strong advocates for equity and for DEIA initiatives. And by DEIA, I mean specifically diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And then you have some librarians who are just neutral on the matter. And so if you're asking how could this be possible, in ALA's 2021 State of the Library report, it broke down where are the challenges coming from. And if you look through a lot of the legislation and even the literature, it will provide you with information on how libraries are responding. And what is very problematic is that some libraries are choosing to respond by engaging in self-censorship. You have librarians who, because they are afraid of the backlash or because they they do not want to lose their job or to become ostracized or to become a target for what is happening with regards to censorship, they are themselves attempting to censor resources. So they're not even putting those items on the library shelves. And so that, again, is very problematic. So we, back to my original point, we as librarians, we have to make sure that we remain staunch advocates for intellectual freedom as well as for diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Because there is so much interconnectedness between in information or intellectual freedom, and as well as for diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, they are essentially two sides of the same coin. And so with that in mind, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I have done. My work has essentially looked at policies to determine whether or not those policies address or have manifest messages of diversity. Because if we are going to address the censorship or be able to defend against censorship efforts, particularly censorship efforts that are trying to silence the voices of specific communities, then we need to make sure that we ourselves counter these efforts by being 
being more commitment, or as David Lankis would say, being radically committed to our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, commitments or our diversity and equity and inclusion work. So in my research, I looked at policies to see if we are doing this. We say that diversity is core to our profession, but when I examined over 200 policies, what I saw was that many of these policies had statements that would articulate messages of diversity, but those statements were often siloed within the policies themselves. So imagine reading a policy that starts off with a very strong mission statement about a commitment to diversity or valuing everyone and being open to all. However, diversity was no longer or not mentioned anywhere else in the policy. And I've read policies that were 30, 40, 60, 100 plus pages long. And there were only one there was only one message in most of these policies of diversity. So we have to think about what is the message that we are really conveying. If in fact, we are committed to making sure that there is equity for all, we cannot just articulate it and have practices or have statements that are benign. We have to have practices that align with the statements or our core values. So why should libraries fight against our censors? Why should we push back on these efforts? One is because censorship itself devalues the fundamental mission of libraries. And it does not promote literacy. It does not protect society. It actually indoctrinates society. It does not liberate. When you control information, you are not liberating people by giving them a single narrative. You are training them to think a certain single solitary way. And that is not liberation. That is a form of oppression. It does not move society forward, but it takes us backwards because the voices that are heard are often those that are in power and the voices that are oppressed are those that that have been oppressed and that continue to be marginalized year after year by those that have the ability to influence legislation the way we are seeing being that's being happening today. And again, it just does not reflect diversity of our world. It only reflects our biases and it only reflects our fears. So when I have these conversations, the things that or what I ask the most from librarians is, how do we do this? How do we fight censorship? And one of the things or some of the tips that I'm going to give you may seem as if it's easier said than done, but I want to remind you, these tips are only going to work if librarians across all sectors of libraries, if we support each other, no longer can we have the viewpoint or this perspective that Censorship is only taking place in school libraries. If you, we go back to the slide that I showed you earlier, you will note that while school libraries have the highest percentage of censorship challenges, public libraries came in second. And we also know from history that once censorship or once one group is silence. Eventually, tyranny will show up for our for each and every one of us. Eventually, it's a matter of time before the same types of laws, the same types of efforts are pushed throughout every sector of library services. So we have to be uniformly committed to the work of librarianships. We have to ask ourselves, are we committed to our core values. Are we for equity for all or are we neutral? We have to make sure that we understand fully the history of censorship and the implication that it has 
on library users and library service services. Because if in fact, we are dealing with a history of discrimination within library services, that history of discrimination is in fact impacting the service that we are that we are seeing today. There are communities that still have inadequate resources. There are communities today that still do not have users, library users do not have access to balanced collections that reflect a myriad of viewpoints or that reflect the pluralistic society in which we live in. We have to make sure, and this is the advice that the American Library Association is given, that in order for us to fight censorship, we have to make sure that we have policies that have reconsideration statements. I like to present to you or to pro-offer that we need to have more than just policies that have reconsideration statements. We have to have policies that make our commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion known. We have to have policies that not only articulate our commitments through statements of diversity, but it has to be very uh, specific about for whom we are leveraging diversity, equity, and inclusion for. Why are we doing it? And also, we have to make sure that that language is embedded throughout our policies. And then we have to make sure that we are resisting the fear that makes some librarians self-censor. And I think the way that we can do that is by supporting each other as librarians, by speaking out against a lot of the censorship that is happening within society. So I would like to leave with you just a few thoughts that I want you to think about. Again, censorship does not help society. Equality is what helps a democratic society because equality is the soul of liberty. And without equality, there is in fact no liberty at all. And we cannot be okay or we should not be okay with liberty for some when we know that there are injustices that are happening to dissimilar groups. He who destroys a good book kills reason itself. And I like to think of this quote when I talk to my students. One of the things I share with my students is that when you attempt to censor a book, you are attempting to silence the very essence of humanity because a book represents the viewpoints, the perspectives, and the experiences of particular groups of individuals. So when we see book burnings, you are not burning just books, you are burning the essence of humanity and thought. And then lastly, I'm going to leave you with this quote that I often say, and within this quote, it is that libraries, we are in a constant state of choice. We have to constantly decide whether or not our actions and whether or not our policies, if they actually promote equity for all. We have to negotiate what, and we have to have these conversations so we can think about what does equity look like for even the most disadvantaged in our library communities. Because if we do not support those groups that are being marginalized or, or oppressed, if we do not bring those groups, if their needs to the forefront to support their liberation, then we are essentially consenting to that group's oppression. And that is not the goal of librarianship. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd like to open it up for questions or for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jameson. Um, I, I see some applause. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. We have a small enough group. I think that if we started to stack 
questions either um, in the chat, which Kelsey's going to help me with, or I think, like I said, with a small enough group, if people want to ask their question verbally, you can take yourself off mute and do that as well. We have enough time and uh, the ability to do that. So I see a hand raised by Gina. So Gina, do you want to verbally ask your question? Yeah, yeah, I put it in the chat, but I can ask it as well. Um, hi, Andrea, thank you so much for speaking us to us today about this very important topic, using your time to um, inspire us and educate us. I was struck by the comment you made about tyranny spreading across our libraries when we see issues in, in one library um, in our community. And the advice that you said that librarians should cross cross lines, remove, get get out of those silos to support each other. Um, do you have an example that you've seen in your work of library types working together on a particular issue in their community? Something that might inspire us. You know, what I am starting to see, and we've had these conversations, and particularly amongst academic librarians, and the support at the very basic level that we're, we're seeing that we can do is if there are libraries, particularly school libraries or public libraries that are facing um, increased censorship challenges and they're being forced to remove certain types of books, that we make sure that we have those books available within our collections so that if a student cannot have access to a book like The Hate You Give in their school, that they can either get it from the public library, and if it's not available in the public library, that even within an academic library that we're starting to open up our collections so that they can have access to those books as well. And so that's one way that we're starting to have these conversations. And it, it seems very hopeful because in order, again, for us to be able to really defend censorship, what happens to one library essentially happens to us all because the, the society does not see us as separate libraries, separate cradles of democracy. They see us as one institution, and that is the that is the institution of librarianship. So we have to make sure that again, uh, and that's just one example, when we start seeing it happen at school libraries, public libraries need to speak out. Public librarians need to speak out. Academic librarians need to speak out, which is what fuels the work that I do. Because sometimes our school librarians, they they don't have, or some of them may feel like they do not have the support to advocate for themselves without losing their job or without putting their career on the line. So how do we support them and how do we speak out from the safety? How do we speak out from our place of privilege? Because if school librarians are being challenged and I'm sitting in academic librarians, as I'm sitting in an academic library or if I'm in academia, then I have a, a different type of place of privilege because I'm not receiving those types of challenges. How do I use the privilege in the space that I'm in to actually help support that school librarian who might be afraid to put their job on the line. Thank you, Andrea. You're speaking directly to me as I'm an academic librarian and I was looking for ways to support my colleagues. So thank you. Thank you for the question. And, and I have to apologize. I live on a, on a street that is busy <laughs> and no matter how many windows I close, I can still hear motorcycles and, and fire trucks. <laughs> so my apologies. That's not part of the presentation. <laughs> Um, I, Kelsey, oh, go ahead. There's a, a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, I did see a question in the chat from Laura. Uh, do you have suggestions about how to encourage more BIPOC people to join our profession? Uh, how do we make the profession seem like a viable and welcoming opportunity? So I, I think part of it is that we have to make sure that our practices align with our core values because what BIPOC communities experience, and this is from the conversations that I've had with members of uh, my colleagues and uh, with other members of the BIPOC communities, um, is that 
when BIPOC members come into certain library spaces to either work or either within library programs, they experience microaggressions or they experience what some librarians back in the early 20th century when uh, the, the dissension, were ha dissension was happening between libraries in the North and the South that they experienced where you have inequities that are prevalent and you have these articulated values, but as libraries, we're not actually incorporating those values. We say we are for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We say that we want spaces that are inclusive, but our actual libraries do not represent Present the diversity that we say that we are committed to. So I think part of it is to make sure that our values are put into practice and that we do not make it the responsibility of BIPOC community or communities that have been historically marginalized to diversify or to make the field of librarianship more equitable. That is the work that we all have to be committed to. And so again, just to make sure that I'm really answering your question, it all goes back to policy, making sure that what's in policy is put into practice. We cannot have policies that say one thing, but the norm reflects whiteness or it reflects the dominant, dominant narrative in society. We have to invite BIPOC community members to the table, and we have to let them know you have a voice, you are being heard. We're not just having these conversations. There will be policies and practices that are put into place based off of the collective voices of everyone that is involved and not just a few. And, and ironically, your question makes me think of a question that I just recently received from a library manager who asked me, who said, we're trying to recruit BIPOC librarians and they will not come to our library. They just will not apply. And then we started to talk about the, the environment. And so the manager admitted that the library is positioned or exist in a town that is known as a sundown town. And so I said to the library manager, so essentially you are asking BIPOC community members, particularly African-Americans, because when you think about sundown towns, and, and, and it's amazing because I can't believe that we're having these types of conversations in 2022 about sundown towns, that they actually still exist, right? They may not exist overtly, but they still exist covertly. And that, that is a testament to the fact that racism and discrimination, it is very enduring and that it can, it can exist because it is very adaptable. It knows how to adapt. But I said to this manager, you're asking a librarian to risk their lives. What, have, what work have you done outside of the library to make sure that you are attempting to educate the community about about being culturally competent and to foster uh, cross-cultural uh, competence and mutual respect. What type of work are we doing outside of the library? Because it's not just good enough to have someone present in the building, we have to make sure that we are responsible to each other and making sure that this work does not unjustly uh, impose or harm any one or any single librarian. But I digress, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't see any more, but I'll give people a minute to think of something. If you have any other questions or comments for Dr. Jameson, now is the time to ask them. <laughs> I see a question from Sarah, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Jamison. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just had a question about a resource that you mentioned partway through um, this author, Paolo, and I just didn't catch the name or the title that you were referring to, but I wanted to follow up about the book. Could you say a little more about it, please? Yes, I can. And I am putting it in the chat. It is Paulo Friere, and I'm hoping I'm saying the name correctly. And the title of the book is The Peta 
Goji of the Oppressed. And it talks about, uh, the book really illuminates what the role of educational institutions should be in terms of making sure that we are not just teaching children or teaching people in society to be, um, to follow the norm or to just to, we're not thinking, we're not, he, he likens it as a banking system, that we're not just creating, reproducing the same type of experiences by teaching the same types of narratives, but that we're actually using education as a form of liberation to teach particularly young minds how to uh, think critically about what's happening in society, because it's only then when we really begin to interrogate what's happening in society, these types, when we have these types of con conversations, do we begin to challenge practices and ask ourselves whether our current practices are actually fair and equitable to everyone. And it's only when we get to that space where we can really begin to move towards a true democracy and information can become a form of liberation and not a form of oppression. Thank you, Jennifer, for the link. <laughs> and thank you for answering my question. Any additional questions or comments for Dr. Jameson? I see a hand raised by Laura or a wave. I, you mentioned the Carnegie libraries and I wonder if you've heard from, um, from folks in public libraries, but also in academic libraries. I work at Vassar College and you know we're constantly on the lists of, <laughs> I, I don't mean to boast, <laughs> but we're, we have this beautiful, gorgeous library. It's huge. It's this vertical Gothic thing with stained glass windows. Um, but one thing that we have heard from, um, from our students, especially students who are first time college, you know, the first members of their family um, to go to college is that the physical space is intimidating. Um, and in Carnegie libraries too, when you walk in and there's, you know, marble and the glowy lamps and all of that, I'm just wondering if you've heard from um, folks dealing with just the, the physical space not being welcoming to um, folks from a variety of backgrounds. Absolutely. And it, it just doesn't, and it doesn't start there, right? It originally starts within the communities at the community level. And in, in, when I say community, I'm specific, specifically speaking about communities that have been, um, that are socially and economically disadvantaged. You have libraries. Well, let's, let's start here. In socially disadvantaged communities, you have schools, administration, pulling librarians from those schools. So disadvantaged communities, the students do not have access to libraries to begin with. Right? Then when they do go to libraries that are in their uh, local community, those library spaces are either also unwelcoming or there is no connection because there isn't a real sense of relationship between the public library and the school library. The schools li school libraries tend to have relationships among themselves, but there is no relationship oftentimes. And there sometimes there is, and I think we're trying to change that narrative, but there isn't enough relationship in disadvantaged communities where students have the opportunity to go into public libraries. So then by the time they come to college, libraries are foreign to them. And if there are library spaces that are um, viewed as these types of building or spaces that are intimidating, we have to ask ourselves, are BIPOC community or disadvantaged community members, are they even using those spaces because of they've probably had a history where they have not been either introduced or welcome or their experiences have been subpar. So again, you know, 
based on your question, we are having these conversations and it's going back to this idea of we have to start being more interconnected as libraries. We have to make sure that there is a clear pipeline for, which is why every public librarian, every academic librarian should be in sense when school librarians are losing their jobs. Because when students do not have access or exposure to school libraries, then they may or may not be have the motivation to use public library spaces. Or when they get into academia, they do not use academic libraries or they do not know how to use academic libraries. And we can talk about the research that really points to the fact that BIPOC community members or students from uh, economically disadvantaged communities, because they are information disadvantage, they do not fare well in these spaces because they do not have the skills to use these resources. So there has to be more interconnectivity so that we're making sure that there is a strong pipeline from the school to the public library space. When I was in a school library and I've had the experience, although I don't know if it was more whether or not I was just being a glutton for punishment, but I've had the opportunity to work in school libraries, public libraries, and in academic libraries. And this is why I'm very adamant. We really do essentially have lots of opportunity to help each other because in school libraries, I wanted my students to be able to use the public library so that when school was out, right? And we saw that with, schools being shut down during the pandemic, I wanted students to be able to go into a public library and still have access to resources that they can use. If they did not have internet at home or if they did not have a computer, they could still have access to these resources. And particularly when they went to college, they would it would increase their chances of success because they knew how to look for information. They knew how to use that information information, and then they move from being users of that information to being disseminators of that information. Thank you. Oh, it looks like uh, Jenny has a question. Jenny, you want to unmute yourself? Are you passing or? Right, let me give Jenny a second. Um, does anybody else have a question for Dr. Jameson? I see lots of comments coming into the chat, um, which are great. Jenny, go ahead. Okay, yes, hello, I'm sorry. It's all right, take uh, your time. I, 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 thank you, Dr. Jameson. I couldn't agree with you more about uh, most most of our students are first generation students using a college, an academic library, the first time. And um, <clears throat> it's very clear that there are questions that we receive from them if they even come into the library. I think a lot of them feel very self-conscious. Um, they even ask if, can they rent books? Meaning, can they take, are they allowed to take a book out? And that's how they, that's how they phrase it. And um, they um, haven't had experience of even visiting a, a public library to use like say the kids room when they were growing up or in middle school or high school. And that's what's so sad. Uh, and so by the time they get to college, they, um, they really don't know, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue and we've been trying very hard for um, uh, outreach uh, to these students to teach them library skills. And yes, you can take books out. You don't read them, you take them, they're here for you. The databases are here for you, they're for free. And um, so um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And so by the time they, they get to the academics, uh, to the colleges, 
they really um, are so inexperienced and it's, um, it's very sad, but a lot of them are very savvy. I, I try to explain to them, you already know how to use um, <clears throat> the internet, but you're using it in a different way now, okay? You're gonna be using it with, with databases, not with TikTok. Um, <clears throat> it's just a matter of techniques and where your focus is gonna be. Uh, but but thank you thank you thank you for your talk it was it was it was excellent thank you very much thank you and and absolutely thank you for just just really emphasizing that point because again I and I think I started to mention this but I may have swayed a little bit from the the, the topic but when I was in school libraries I made sure my students. I had a partnership, I knew the public librarian, and we have to do that more because we do want to make library spaces welcoming for students and for younger generations, particularly, and censorship is attempting to unravel that work, which is why I said earlier, censorship is not about censoring books. It's about unraveling democracy and, and really trying to pull apart the very foundation of the work that we, that libraries really exist, the purpose that we exist to accomplish. And, you know, again, speaking of spaces, we have to make sure that spaces are welcoming. And, and Amy, I'm so glad that you are having conversations with those students that are coming in and they're saying, hey, I don't, I don't, they show that they don't know how to utilize the library and that they don't have that experience and you're making it welcoming for it. And I think that's our role to make sure that we are making the library space as welcoming as possible. One of the first thing I do when I go into a library and I evaluate libraries or when I was in a school because I was a part of the leadership team, I would look in the library and I wanted to see physically, if you tell me you're committed, to equity for all, then I need to see all physically, visually, because that's that first impression is visual. When I step into that space, visually, do I see myself reflected? And we need to think about that. Every patron that walks through our library door, can they visually see themselves represented? And we already have a challenge because we don't see ourselves represent, most BIPOC community members don't see themselves represented in the staffing, and they often don't see themselves represented in the books. And now that we're starting to gain traction and have more books that are being representative of diverse experiences, now we have censors saying, no, we have to stop that. We have to pause that. You can't reflect the LGBTQIA experience, right? And then the rhetoric that's being used to justify why it should not happen is very, it's, it's almost inflammatory because I believe that that language is being used or that you have people, groups of people that's trying to use the law to hide uh, racist attempts. Sorry, are there any more questions? Like the long pause, people are thinking. <laughs> Anything else for Dr. Jameson? All right. So one thing I wanna add, if I just have like a minute, is yep. that when you're thinking about your policies, I would encourage you to revisit those policies, to see if your policies, how your policies articulate your commitments to diversity. Policies guide practice. And if you vaguely mention diversity in your policy, what type of practice do you think that's producing? Because you have librarians who are very skilled and experienced and they understand because of their experience, they are aware of a lot of the issues involving representation in libraries. So that, that experienced librarian may know that they have to be intentionally uh, strategic about securing representation for diverse groups. They might know that they have to advocate, but for that librarian that is new 
or that librarian that is inexperienced or that librarian that I hate to say it is neutral if it's not in policy, they do not have a guide that is going to provide with them for them steps that is going to walk them through the process of not only that we, this is the value of diversity, but this is how we build or this is how we show diversity within our collections. Because again, most of these censorship uh, challenges, they're aiming to silence and to further oppress marginalized voices. Any more questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Jameson. We have a lot to reflect on. Um, I'm thinking of all kinds of things in, right now. Um, and I really appreciate you being with us today. And thank you everybody for the excellent questions. Um, I love it when presenters have a great presentation, but also spend like another half an hour answering all of our questions because you don't know what we're going to ask. And you did an excellent job answering all of our questions. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, yeah. So I'm going to move on to the other parts of the meeting, which is hard to do. It's hard to trans. It's hard transitions are hard, but I'm going to do that. And you're welcome to stay, uh, you know, a little bit longer. But um, again, thank you for being here today. And um, I have more questions for you, and I might email you some. <laughs> if anybody else does, can we send you a couple <laughs> questions? Are you open to that? <laughs> now that I'm asking in front of 36 people, thank you so much, Dr. Jameson. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> All right, give me a second to regroup here. You should see the slide with her name on it. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes. All right. I have one last order of business before we finish the annual meeting. And that is to um, recognize Mary Allen. You're wearing, you're wearing purple today, I love it. This is a picture from the annual meeting, um, the 50th gala that we did. We got a really nice shot of you at the microphone. So before we conclude today, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Mary Allen and her service to Southeastern. Mary Allen has served multiple terms on the board beginning in 1996. So let's reflect on that. Let's ponder <laughs> on that. 1996, where were we all in 1996? That was the first time you served on Southeastern's board. In that time, you were president, if I crown correctly, for five and a half years. In the early 2000s, uh, a few years ago in 2016 through 2018, and again now. Um, and then you were past president, like after all those terms as president. So I want to thank you, Mary Ellen, so much yeah. for your service and dedication to this organization. You are our biggest champion. You lead the board in this organization with steadfast confidence, mm -hmm. and you give us your full support. You have been and continue yeah. to be a mentor to many of us, myself included. I know that you're not leaving the board just yet. We have you for one more year, right. <laughs> but since this is your last annual meeting as board president, I want to give you a collective thank you from all of us. So thank you, Mary Ellen. Well, thank you everybody. You're more than welcome, Tessa. As many of you have heard me say, this is one of my favorite things to do is to be on the Southeastern board, uh, including being the president. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I've been around for a long time, not the whole 55 years, but pretty damn near it. It's pretty so, near close to, it's more, if I can count, right? It's like at least <laughs> half, so. Right, so um, I, um, when I left the library profession to go into school administration, my ability to stay with Southeastern kept my fingers in my favorite thing to do is to talk about libraries and support libraries. So I've learned a lot from being um, on the board all these years and being associated with Southeastern. I've made friends. Um, so it's my pleasure to um, 
be on the board to be the president. And I thank you all for your support. Thank you. I don't have, I'm trying to do too many things. I can't do my, uh, my, my, okay, you're getting some reactions there. Yes, I, um, I, I'm seeing what the chat is saying. So thank yeah, you good. for your comments. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Our last, my last slide and the last thing I want to mention is that um, next Friday, we're having a spring open house. This is at an orchard near the office. It's called Twin Star Orchards. Um, so this is an opportunity to get together with all of us in person. It's, uh, I can say here, it's in the late afternoon. We're going to be serving, um, or they are going to be serving uh, pizza from like a wood oven, like really good pizza and, and cider. Um, so please join us. There's registration up. And so we can, you know, get a count for how many people want to come. Um, it's just two hours, real low key, just a, a social event, which is what we can't do here because we're on Zoom. So we're going to do that next week. Um, if you could please fill out the evaluation for today's meeting, we really appreciate your feedback. Any feedback for us or Dr. Jameson, if you could put that on the evaluation, we use that in planning for next year and it really helps us out if everybody will complete the evaluation. Um, putting a plug in for her newsletter. This is how we distribute information about our programs and services. If you learned, you might've learned about today's annual meeting through the newsletter or it got forwarded to you. Um, but if you're on the newsletter, you're going to get it firsthand. So if you're not signed up for the newsletter, I really appreciate it if you would take a minute to, to sign up for it. We don't send out that much, um, but Carolyn and Kelsey and I use it often to send out the newsletter and like a, Carolyn does like a, a bi-monthly meeting roundup. Um, and the last thing is our annual meeting next year is planned for June 2nd. Don't know much about what's going to happen, where it's going to be, could be hybrid, could probably some kind of hybrid event next let's, year. Let's we'll it, see. I mean, last year I promised anyway. online and here we are on Zoom again. So I don't know <laughs> what the world has in store for us, but we'll be here for an annual meeting in some format next June. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, your time and being here with us. Um, the trustees have a quick meeting in a few minutes. I'm going to put the link in the chat in a second. Um, and that wraps up our 2022 annual meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye.